Good afternoon, everyone, and sorry for the delay. I was having a bit of some technical problems. Uh, Eric and I are glad to uh, talk to you tonight about the Triple P. You know, Triple P uh, was an easy application, one page. The forgiveness is 11 pages. For me, it's a bit of a headache and full of some imprecise and confusing language, and hopefully we can straighten that out for you tonight a little bit. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, the guidance continues to be, oh, one more, uh, back one, please, disclaimer. So the Triple P guidance continues to be released. Um, as you know, this rollout has been kind of messy and chaotic. The, we are current as of last night. Uh, the materials, of course, are subject to change here. Uh, what you're going to hear tonight is Eric's and my views, and these are not the views of SCORE. And we are not rendering any kind of professional or advice or services to you. Let's go to the next slide, please. So we're going to talk a little about background, give you an update on the forgiveness, talk about the uh, form, the forgiveness form, 3508, and then open up to questions for you, and hopefully some good answers. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, the good news. Uh, there's still money left. There's over $100 billion left. So if you have not applied, you still got time to apply. Uh, the other good news is they have about $511 billion has been uh, uh, let out in Triple P. Uh, California, where I suspect most of us are in, has gotten the largest share of Triple P. And small businesses, businesses under uh, loan size under $1 million has for 64%. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, our first question here. Um, we'd like to get your feedback on one, of course, now the, uh, my question is in the middle of it. Uh, one is what is the amount, if you have a triple P loan, what's the amount of your loan? And if you don't have one, are you considering applying? So we'll give you a few minutes to uh, answer that. And then we're, uh, Elisa, or maybe you can jump back in and give us kind of the results of that. Absolutely. Uh, as you're doing, okay, excuse me, sorry. No, no, I was going to say we have about 30, 30, 30 people have responded, so we'll just give it another couple seconds. Sorry. Great. As, as we're waiting, let's go to the next slide. Okay. As we get started, I, I think we I want to, you know, there's a bunch of shifting roles and complicated terms here, but I think the thing to remember, what we're really trying to do is think post-pandemic, what was our payroll? And, you know, what, how do we line up post-pandemic payroll with the pre-crisis um, headcount wages and hours? So there's a bunch of rules here, and we're going to go through them a little. Eric, maybe you can talk to me a little about the 75% rule. I, I, they've got some kind of division here now that they didn't have before. and what? Maybe, first of all, let's just talk what is the 75% rule, and now – how do we apply it? Okay. The 75% rule is that for forgiveness purposes, you need to use at least 75% of the amount forgiven for payroll costs. And we'll come later to what qualifies as payroll costs. And the remaining 25% can be used for specified other co costs, which we'll also go through in some detail a little bit later in the presentation. The key here is that... Um, that 25% is calculated on what you actually achieve as far as forgivable payroll costs. It's not based on how much you've borrowed. So for example, if you borrow uh, $1.2 million, um, but you only use $750,000 for payroll costs, then you would divide 750,000 by 0.75, um, and that would give you a total that could, could be forgivable of a million dollars maximum, not a million two in that instance. So you need to be doing that calculation against what you actually achieve on the forgivable payroll cost. So a couple important things changed here. We were really unsure if, uh, and I think of this, and maybe this is not the right word, uh, 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 Eric, so maybe you can help me come up with the right words, but we were not sure if this 75% rule was going to be a cliff or not. And what I mean by that was it an all or nothing. Did you have to either 
qualify for total forgiveness or could you do partial forgiveness? And what this new formula indicates is that you can have partial forgiveness. So in this case, as, uh, as Eric pointed out, even though we had a $1.2 million uh, pre-payroll kind of loan amount that was for salaries, we only spent 750,000. So the most that we could forgive was 1 million now. So that's the first standard. So I think that's really important that it's not a cliff that you can have partial uh, forgiveness here. Eric, did you want to add anything to that kind of partial forgi forgiveness? No, I think that uh, you've got it. The two key parts to that are that uh, the calculation for how much in total is forgivable is off of your forgivable payroll and that the 25% rule applies against that. And there's no, there hasn't been any major changes in the 25%. And we'll talk a little more about what uh, uh, non-payroll costs are and, and what can be put in there. And you hear a little, uh, uh, a little dissension among Eric and I, what we think can be put in there or not. Um, Elisa, do we have any uh, feedback on that uh, first survey question? We do, and I'm sharing the results right now. Are you able to see that? About 76% yes. of people um, received $100,000 and under. Okay. Well, and for those that got greater than 750,000, four people, congratulations. That's, that's tremendous. Uh, quite impressive that, so it looks like we've had, uh, I guess about 43 people that have uh, answered the question. And so we got 43 people that uh, received a triple P. That's great news. And two people that are gonna apply, good. Okay, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, what are forgivable payroll costs and how has that changed? Eric, maybe we can just briefly go back and summarize what those costs were and now how has it changed? Okay, so the, what the costs were um, and, and really the key parts that have changed, I'll emphasize here in a second, uh, gross wages and salaries, employer health insurance contributions, so what you're paying for benefits for your employees, um, including retirement contributions, and then state, uh, the employer portion of the state and local uh, payroll taxes or the things that the employer gets to include in that calculation. Um, what's hey, been hey, Eric, I all, if I can interrupt you for a minute, I always get confused here. Now we cannot include the employer federal taxes, is that right? The, Correct, the, but you do uh, get to FICA. include, yes. FICA and um, Medicare are excluded from that on the employer side. You do get to include the portion that's the employee contribution on those items. And again, it's gross wages. So um, you get to include the total gross wage amount, not the amount after the specified employee withholding. Okay, great. Okay, and then the, the cap has always been there, which is that um, the total salary uh, the gross wages number that you're allowed for any given employee is $100,000 and anything above that needs to be adjusted down to $100,000 and you'll see that calculation in the forgiveness form. The big change here is that we got clarification on how you would calculate the amount that can be paid to sole proprietors and business owners. Um, and that is done now based on the net income that's reported on the business owner schedule C for the calendar year 2019. Um, and that means that, for example, if you'd taken $60,000 a year uh, for the year in, or you showed $60,000 for that year in net income on line 31 of your schedule C, you could do $5,000 a month um, for reimbursement to yourself that would be eligible for PPP forgiveness. Uh, and that's the basis for that calculation. And that's an important um, distinction because we did not have guidance there. And as we go to the next slide, uh, what you'll see is it also excludes um, benefits, health insurance uh, and retirement benefits for owners of uh, businesses. So there's less as an owner that you can take into that calculation of gross wages for your own compensation. 
And I know I saw a before, question. I'm sorry, go ahead, Greg. No, before we go to the next slide, though, I wanted to make sure that it, uh, that in, in any case, because of this eight week rule, no owner can, a salary can exceed 15, approximately $15,000. That would be the max an owner or someone over 100,000 could really record for that eight week period. Is that, is that correct, Eric? Exactly. So that 15,000 and change represents uh, the equivalent of $100,000 annualized when you look at the eight week period. So for a business owner, you get to take the lesser of that 15,000 or what you actually would have ca gotten by calculating it based off of your 2019 uh, tax returns. And, and it's really important when we get to the form section to realize that the SBA is going to look in three buckets here that are going to be really important to them. One, they're, they're going to separate, bifurcate folks that make under 100,000 and over 100,000. So you're going to have to report that separately. And then they're also going to have a separate line for business owners. So this is something that is sensitive to them and they will track it. And let, let me just make one clarification here based on one of the questions that I saw that was submitted before the um, webinar. The term business owner here se seems to apply to sole proprietors um, and to LLCs and S corps where income is being passed through to the owner um, as um, an entity uh, and not uh, paid out as salary. So if you're a C corporation, even if you are the majority or sole owner of the corporation, if you've been getting paid salary through the corporation, um, you would do the calculation as any other employee, obviously subject to the $100,000 cap. Um, and you would continue to do that calculation based on what your W-2 uh, reported income. Yeah, I think Eric points out that the key um, distinction there is, is the entity paying taxes, corporate taxes or not, or are they what we call pass-through? And if it's pass-through, uh, then you're a business owner versus a corporate. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide, please. And Eric, you kind of stole the thunder here, so why don't you just go ahead with it? Right. I think we actually covered most of this at this point, which is um, the things that are excluded for owners um, here um, were clarified, and it does exclude the uh, health insurance, uh, retirement benefits, um, and uh, anything that would be attributable to partners uh, as far as partnership profits um, or LLC profits. And again, as Greg said, this is the concept of pass-through as opposed to taxed at the corporate level. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. So this is that forgivable non-payroll cost. And I think a couple of things to highlight here are, we always talk about this mortgage interest. And you know, when I think of mortgage interest, Eric, I always think of just like my house uh, mortgage. But it seems like here it can include what we call uh, personal property, which I, I guess is vehicles. Is that right? Can we can we add? Can I can I deduct the interest I'm paying for my corporate car? Yes, I believe that you can deduct interest on corporate car. For that matter, if you have leases on other um, property, so equipment leases uh, and the like, where you're paying interest on those um, as personal property, um, then you should be able to deduct those as well. And you want to confirm that with your accountant, but the rules as they're now written would suggest that uh, anything that you own as property, um, whether real or personal, that you're paying interest on, uh, you would be able to deduct the interest during the previous period. So any kind of loan I have I sh that's related to my business, I should be able to deduct that interest under this 25% rule. Is that, is that correct? Yes. Okay, you know, utilities is this kind of a word that we kind of throw out there. And let's talk about the definition of utilities, Eric. Obviously, electricity and water and gas, we always think of those electricities. A phone? Certainly, and in this day and age, your internet as well. Okay, and here's where Eric and I have a little bit of a, a discussion 
and we suggest you make sure you go and talk it over with your tax accountant, whether uh, gas and mileage would be included in that or not. Um, and I, I think it might be, and so I would advise you to uh, go out and seek advice from your tax accountant, what they think it would be under these rules. But that, for many of you, that could be a, a, a major issue, the mileage and the gas. I, I know, Eric, you're, you're a bit uh, 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 less unsure about that. I'm a little more conservative on this one, but I think it's good advice to talk to your accountant and, and also to see what got additional guidance might come out to, as we go forward. And, and certainly, if you're a company that's not going to have any trouble at all getting to the 25%, I wouldn't start by including those items. If, if you find that you're falling short of the 25% and you um, have repaid all of your payroll, um, then you might want to look into taking those items and then uh, investigating whether those would be accepted. Okay, let's go to Eric. Anything else on this page, or should we go to the nope. next the next slide? Okay, next let's go to the next slide. Okay. Okay, this is a change, and let's talk about the eight week period thing, uh, Eric. And first of all, does it does it apply to everything, or does it, does it just apply this this uh, my alternative eight week period? That alternative eight week period notion does it apply just to wages? Or does it apply to everything in, in, my, in my forgiveness package? Oh, it only applies to wages, uh, and it's intended to make life easier for companies by letting you match the um, period to your payroll. Um, and I know people had questions about this. So essentially, you can line up the start and end with your uh, payroll period so that you don't end up with the need to do calculations based on Trump periods uh, within your payroll. So big assist in making uh, doing the calculations easier because you can just get data from your payroll company um, and run with it without having to have anybody do any extra calculation. And, and to make sure we understand what, when you can do this, it's either when you, you know, paid the person, provided a paycheck to the person, distributed that paycheck, or even when the ACH, which is kind of how the, your bank gets hit, is credited. So in, when any one of those things occur, that will be effective that, uh, that you can include it. I, I think that's correct, right, Eric? Yes. Okay. Uh, anything else on this that we should talk about, Eric? Well, I think the only thing we, did, we, we skipped over quickly is that for the 25% of costs that are not payroll related, um, it can be costs that are incurred during the period or costs that were incurred in prior periods that you would normally pay um, in the ordinary course of business during that eight week period. So um, if you had rent, uh, well, rent's probably a bad example. If you got your utility bill um, for April um, in May and you paid it in May, that would be an acceptable uh, use of funds under the 25% rule. Oh, well, let me give you, a, let me have a question about that, Eric. I got my uh, triple P loan on, uh, let's say, May 4th. I'm a little slow paying my rent, so I hadn't paid my rent yet. I paid my rent on the 7th. So I should be able to include that rent, right? Yes. I then pay June's rent on, let's say, June 2nd, so I can include that. Correct. But I'm running a little bit short of that 25% thing, and I think, well, gosh, my eight weeks are going to end in the end of June. I'll just pay July's rent on June 29th. Can I then include that too? So this one's a gray area. Um, you would have a question as to whether that's in the normal course of business to prepay rent. Um, and so I would ask, check with your accountant and make sure that you have um, some comfort from them as to how they're going to interpret that rule. Um, and also um, look to your bank potentially for some guidance on that. Yeah, certainly, you know, paying it four or five days ahead of time, you might be able to be okay, but you certainly are not going to be able to pay December's rent in June. Right. 
Exactly. So, uh, 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 so you know, there might be a little early way, but again, it's good to check and see what um, guidance you can from your tax account and from your uh, SBA bank. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay. This is all about ETFs, or uh, and, and when I think of ETFs, uh, or FTEs, excuse me, FTEs, full-time equivalents. So let's talk a little about a full-time equivalent, Eric. What, it, what do we mean, and let's put it both in exempt and non-exempt, first of all. What is a, do, if I have an exempt, which is someone that is paid on salary, do I even worry about how many hours a week they work? Generally speaking, no. Um, an exempt employee for payroll purposes is usually calculated on a 40-hour week and um, would be counted as one FTE. The only variable on that is if you've done a reduction in uh, hours and rolled back salaries accordingly, um, you may have to treat that person as less than one full FTE based on the reduction in wages um, and the corresponding reduction in hours. So um, you should pay attention so, to that. Good. Okay. But, and so I, I think I got a little ahead of myself here, Eric. So the first, make sure we, let's do a review here a little. So the first hurdle to see if, if it's going to be reduced, if, if or it's going to be forgiven is this 75% rule, which tells me the maximum that can be forgiven. <clears throat> And then I go to a second set of rules now, which are going to talk about my full-time equivalents and my employees. And I have a whole set of rules around that. Is, that. is that how to think about it, Eric? Yes. So you need to not only meet the salary thresholds, but you need to have this to get full um, reimbursement or forgiveness. You need to maintain the same number of FTEs as you had okay. uh, before. And this calculation, the FE calculation has now been clarified um, and you get an option. There's two ways you can do it. So it makes it a little easier. So let's talk about this thing. It's gone from monthly to weekly. What does that mean? Do I have to look at my FTEs every week and say yes or no? What, what does that weekly calculation mean? So you do need to do the FTE calculation on a weekly basis, not on a monthly average, which means that if you have a business where you are gradually bringing people back over the course of a month, you're going to have not meet the FTE requirement uh, under this new guidance. Um, whereas before, if you had at the end of the month, uh, all of your people back and the FTE count matched, you would be okay. So you need to be careful in looking at um, how you may be bringing people back or adjusting people's hours um, as your business ramps back up. Uh, because that's a trap that you can get caught in when you do this calculation on the forgiveness uh, application and find that you fall short on the FTE and maybe in some cases substantially short on the FTE. So I'm going to do my calculation. I'm going to look at my FTEs by week and kind of sum that up to see what my total FTE is for that. And that will determine, at least on the FTE number, how much is forgiven or not? Is that is that kind of the a big yes. picture view over there, Eric? Okay. Yes, it is. What is this? What's this decrease in salaries by greater than twenty percent? Now I cut all my employees' salaries by twenty percent, not twenty five. So am I okay? What's this twenty five percent thing? Yes. Yeah, so the twenty five percent is a safe harbor. So as I mentioned before, particularly if you had salary employee, but this is true across the board, if you decrease salary by less than 25%, you don't, uh, that's not deemed to impact your FTE calculation. If you decrease salaries by greater than 25%, you need to make adjustments uh, on the assumption that that corresponds to a reduction in hours and hence your FTE count goes down. And, and, and Eric, maybe you can just define for some of us what you mean by a safe harbor. So safe harbor uh, is a fancy term for you're okay and they're not going to force you to do an alternative calculation or question um, your FTE numbers. Okay. And then, and then, and then I guess there's really not much else on this page that we need to talk about, is there? No, I think that's, 
Okay, that's, let's go. That's yeah. probably the two biggest big concepts in this page. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, now this kind of goes to how do you determine an FTE? And this, I got a little ahead of myself, Eric, on, on talking about this in the slide before, and I realized that. So if I, if I have an exempt employee, I don't worry about this 40 hours. They just count as a full-time FTE. Is that correct? correct? Yes. And then if I have these hourly folks, they count as, I then got to look at how many hours they work. If they work 45, they're still just one. Anything greater than 40 is still discounted as one. Let me ask you a question about that. If, if I do, it, it, I know I'm going to count as one, but if, say if they work overtime, can I, can I nope. use that salary in my one. calculation? You, you, as long as you don't pass the $100,000 cap, yes, you can use their salary. But from an FTE perspective, they count as one. Okay. And then it looks like I got some kind of safe harbor here with people less than 40. Can you help me understand what the less than 40 and I can count them as 0.5 if I want? What is that? Yes. What's so, that all about? So the rules try to make, simplify this calculation for people. And you should do the calculation both ways to see which works better for your business. But um, you're allowed to just say that anybody works that works less than 40 hours a week gets assigned a value of half an FTE. Um, and do the calculation that way. And if all of your part-time employees or the, or the bulk of your part-time employees are working half time or less, that calculation is good for you and uh, I would take advantage of it. But if you have a bunch of your employees that work three quarter time, um, then you would wanna do the longer calculation on a per employee basis uh, and it's basically how many hours against that 40. So 30 hours against a 40 hour uh, week would be 0.75, 20 hours would be 0.5, et cetera. So um, that may be in some cases worth doing the extra calculation because you will come out with a higher FTE number. Okay. And I think one really important thing here is this this exemption? And please tell me how it works, Eric. So, if someone, if 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 I ask someone to come back to work and they don't want to come back to work because they're doing better on unemployment, that's not going to be a negative for me. If someone it, it leaves me because they find a better job, that's not a negative for me. Or if I terminate someone for cause, that's not a negative. But how does that how does that work in my calculation in my in in in, in my compensation? Do I get to just add their number in. So if, when I look at my weekly uh, FT count, uh, a person Z left, but I can just put them in as one. Is that, yes. is that how I do that? It, it, well, you get to put them in as what they were. So if they were one before they're one now, if they were 0.5 before they're 0.5 now. So, uh, but yes, uh, if somebody, if you offer someone their job back and they decline to take it, um, you should document that you have to, the requirements say you need to document that in writing. So you need to send them a written letter um, saying that you're offering them back and then document how they decline um, and so that you have a record of that as well. Um, and then you get to count that person. And then if somebody quits or if you terminate them because they're not performing their job or for some other cause, um, then you get to include them in your calculation as well. Okay, so I get to include them in my FTE calculation. So this person, why that left, um, basically was making a hundred grand a year. So, how about their compensation? Do I get to include that in my my seventy five percent rule to help me there or not? My understanding of that is yes, you do get to count that um, in your payroll and in your seventy five percent rule. Um, I would double check that, but uh, based on what I've seen among the guidance, the Q and A that uh, was issued by the SBA, that would appear to be the case. Okay, so this is very important for uh, uh, maybe some of you out there, people that aren't coming back, people that found a different job, that you uh, they cannot, you know, you can say, oh my gosh, I had two people left, I'm never going to make the uh, the 75 percent of the FT count. No, you still can. Um, so that this is really good clarification they have in here. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, tax treatment, just my favorite subject, Eric. 
So help me understand what do I, what I even care about the stack stream? What's it all about? Well, you care about it because you want to make sure that you're not paying more tax than you need to and that you're making sure you're uh, paying the taxes that you do need to pay. So the two key takeaways here are um, if you achieve loan forgiveness uh, under your PPP, that is not treated as taxable income. So it should not be recorded um, in a way that it would be recorded as taxable income. Now, the, the other side of the coin on this is the IRS took a position that may or may not have been the intention of Congress, um, which is whatever costs that you pay uh, based on the PPP loan forgiveness amount are then not deductible as business expenses. So the salaries and the 25% um, that you would have normally been able to deduct as expenses for your business don't get deducted. So you're businesses net income will be correspondingly higher. We're hoping that uh, if Congress didn't intend for that to be the case, there will be some clarification in subsequent legislation. But for now, that's, that's the way this works. Okay, let me, let me pull that apart because you said some really important stuff there, Eric. So I usually get to deduct my utilities and my rent and my phones for my taxes as expenses. You're saying currently how it's written, because if I if for this eight week period, if I pay with the, for those with triple P money, and document and say I'm paying with that for triple P money, they would not be deductible on my taxes next year. Is that is that what you just said? Yes, and I mean I mean more simply or more broadly, uh, if you get a hundred thousand dollars in loan forgiveness that was used to cover business expenses, so that would be the wages and rent utilities, et cetera, um, you're going to have $100,000 less that you get to deduct um, from your operating expenses. We, I, I think we hope that that will be clarified and changed if necessary by the IRS, so that would be tax deductible. But at this point, Eric's absolutely right. Let me ask you a question on that, which I should have asked you earlier, but now that you talk about taxes here, Eric, 401k matches, is that deductible? Can I put that in my comp, 75% uh, number? So let's not use the word deductible there, but say, yes, it can go into the PPP loan forgiveness calculation. So um, those amounts that are paid there would be an employee benefit um, that should be apply able to uh, apply in the forgiveness calculation yeah thanks for correcting my language there eric and, and how about bonuses can i also include that in the in the 75 percent calculation within the 100k constraint and the constraints on owners uh compensation that we talked about earlier um yes you can pay bonuses, I would suggest that you probably want to pay them somewhat cons consistent with your historic practices, um, but there's nothing in here that would prohibit the payment of bonuses. And for that matter, if um, you are looking at, have you met the FTE requirements and have uh, some additional money available for forgiveness, um, you, you might look at paying reasonable uh, additional bonuses or compensation. Okay, and the other tax issue on here is that the loan forgiveness is not treated is not taxable income. Is that is that the other key takeaway on this slide? That's correct. So I mean, what, okay. what a lot of people have said is they're giving with one hand and taking away with the other hand in this particular slide. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, the process. So. The process, as we talked about, was uh, issued about two weeks ago on a Friday with a, uh, a package of about 11 pages uh, of instructions and forms to fill out. And it needs to be submitted to the SBA lender. And it's a form 3508. You can, I think we have that on our website. And certainly we can, uh, it's a good time if you're not a SCORE uh, client to become one and a SCORE mentor can help you kind of guide you through that, help you with the filling out that of that. So please become a client and go to santabarbarascore.org and sign up 
for a mentor. Um, the deadline for this, it doesn't, there's no deadline for submitting this, Eric? At this point, there is no stated deadline. Of course, it's in your interest to get it in sooner rather than later uh, for a couple of reasons. One, um, you'd like to get the forgiveness recorded and know that you've achieved it. Um, and two, if it's not, if you don't get forgiveness, um, you want to know how much of the loan is going to remain outstanding and how much interest, how much interest is going to accrue on it. And when your uh, repayment starts, what your monthly payments are going to be. And it looks like the process to obtain forgiveness is fairly lengthy. It looks like five months. Is that right? 60 days plus 90 days. Uh, it, it can be up to five months, which I uh, was surprised by. Um, it's going to be a much slower process, um, probably with more detailed review than we originally anticipated. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, here's a big change, Eric. Maybe talk to me a little, and this looks like one of, another one of these safe harbors that wasn't so safe. Um, talk to me about the review and what happens and what, what do they mean by uh, impossible for review? The SBA uh, realized that perhaps this was a system that was rife for abuse uh, and that there were not uh, enough safeguards in the process for uh, both issuing the loans and uh, for determining forgiveness on those loans. And so they've come back now and said very clearly that um, they have uh, the ability to review any loan of any size um, as they're going through this process. Um, and I think the takeaway here is you want to keep very good records. You want to make sure that uh, you're being accurate in the calculation. We'll come in a minute or two here to showing you what you need to certify, but you should read those certifications carefully and make sure that uh, you're being truthful um, and that uh, you can actually make those certifications. And if somebody comes back to look, um, you're not going to have run afoul of the rules. You don't want to be the person they make an example of. Stay within the reservation, so to speak. <clears throat> okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, let's go to polling question number two. And this is a really interesting one. I want to get everyone's opinion about this. Is how much of the loan are you expecting to be forgiven? Under 50%, 50 to 75%, or over 75%? And as you uh, do this quick survey, we're going to continue here. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, the application. So the application itself is as a, 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 what they, what's called a calculation form then representations and certifications, a Schedule A, a Schedule A workshop, a worksheet, excuse me, and then some optional things about demographic information about the borrower. Now we're gonna go through each one of these in some detail so you get familiar with them. But again, another point here, if you don't have a score mentor, get one and they can go in much greater detail about each of these forms. Let's go to the uh, next uh, slide, please. But before we start that, Elisa, do we have uh, many re, uh, uh, results yet for poll number two? Oh, uh, we do. Um, how much are you expecting? Under 50%. So most people are expecting uh, to have it forgiven, over 75. Uh, very few of you, uh, only one under, and 50 to 75, eight. Okay, I like positive thinking people. Let's, get, let's talk about this uh, loan forgiveness calculation form. So the kind of the top half of this form is just some information, the kind of the words about, about yourself, the borrower, and all that kind of information. So that's the top half of the form. Uh, and, and remember, this came, this came, it's about 11 pages of forms and instructions that you can find. And you just have to search for SBA form 3508. The bottom half of the form, let's go to the next slide, please. So this is the bottom half of the form, and this is where it gets kind of interesting. This is where all the numbers kind of go. Uh, and so this is where you talk about uh, both your FTE numbers and your 75% rule, 
And so this is an important part of the form where you figure out exactly what portion can be forgiven or not here. Um, Eric, is there anything you want to highlight on this form? I think the thing to highlight on this form is that this is the place where you're going to lay out your case for forgiveness by the numbers. And this is the place where the SBA is going to start with any review that uh, they do. So you want to take the time here to make sure that you go through this, understand it. If you don't understand it, uh, reach out, work with the, a SCORE mentor to make sure that you're accurate in what you're putting on this form. And we're going to come to the worksheet um, in a minute or two here. And that is a tool that is very useful in helping you um, get to some of the numbers that you'll need to put on this form. Okay, and just remember that um, all this is submitted to your lending bank, which will review it for accuracy and any uh, misinformation, discrepancies, or anything like that, and then they will submit it to the uh, SBA. Let's go to the next uh, 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 page, please. Okay, Eric, maybe you can help me a little with what are reps and certifications? What, what, are, what do we mean there, and, and, and why am I doing this? So reps and certifications are statements that you're making at, uh, of fact, um, and then the certification is you certifying or affirming that those are true statements. Um, and then that you understand the consequences of making inaccurate or untrue statements. Um, and as I said a few minutes ago, you want to read these carefully. You want to make sure you understand them because the basis for a claim against you individually or your business um, for any malfeasance, for any wrongdoing in uh, submitting the request for forgiveness will be that you made inaccurate or fraudulent representations and certifications. So make sure you understand what you're certifying here and make sure you're comfortable that what you're supplying um, in the application is accurate. So read these over. If you don't understand them or you have questions about them, please talk to your accountant, your attorney, or score mentor. There's a, a large number. We're gonna, let's go to the next slide and we'll see even more. So it continues on. So please read them over, understand them. You know, they have, uh, you know, a, a law here that USC is a, you know, it's a legal law site they're talking about. Um, so just make sure that you take this seriously and please understand it and read it carefully. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Schedule A. I guess the schedule is kind of where I do the math. Is that it, Eric? It is. And when I first saw this, the first thing that I thought of that it, for those of you who've done one of these recently or remember was it's essentially the same as the worksheet on the bottom of your W-4 when you're trying to calculate the withholding for your income tax uh, that you give to your employer. Um, this is a little bit more complicated, but the idea here is this is a tool to help you go through and do the calculations. So it tries to make it easier for you to do the calculations. You don't submit this uh, Schedule A with your application. Um, so it's something you use to work, walk through it, run through the numbers, come up with the numbers that you would then go back and enter on the application itself. So this is, there's a Schedule A and there's a, and there's a Schedule A workshop. Work, uh, worksheet that also helps you here. And this is really where you either want to sit down with your uh, accountant or your score mentor that really can go and work through this with you. Now is the time to start thinking about this. I don't know where if you're like halfway through your triple P loan period or not, but you know, you don't want to wait to the, exactly the end of your triple P because that's it hard, it's harder to make adjustments. So right now is a great time to start thinking where you are in the triple P process. And you know, it might be still some time to make some adjustments so more of the loan can be forgiven. Uh, let's go to the next uh, slide, please. Okay, more of Schedule A just kind of continues on. So the numbers you enter, you do here, you would then take the, these numbers will then flow up through the calculation form, which is the form you do submit. Eric, is there anything particularly we want to talk about on this one? 
Well, this is, this is the place where you're doing the FTE calculation. And so again, make sure you understand that calculation. Um, ask for help if you're not sure how, how to do the calculation because it's a critical part of how much uh, forgiveness you can achieve. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, supporting documents. So these are the kind of things that you must provide. You know, you got your third party payroll service reports, you got the payroll tax filings, your bank account statements. So, so what you paid, canceled checks and invoices, your leases. You're not required to submit that Schedule A worksheet or anything like that, but you are required to retain everything for at least six years. And if required, the SBA will have, it will have access to these documents. Let's go to the next slide, please. Oh boy. Okay, Eric, one of my <laughs> favorite slides here. So there's a real question about how to record this on your income and balance sheet, and all that kind of things, and all that QuickBook stuff. And it really revolves around whether this is going to be forgiven or not. If I knew for sure it was forgiven, that it was going to be 100% forgiven, um, I myself, Eric, would do option two. Um, uh, uh, but if you're not sure, option two might not work as well. But maybe, Eric, you can run us through what the different options are and what the advantage or disadvantage of doing this. I, I will say it's most important for you to talk to your tax accountant to understand and see how they want to treat, treat the tax treatment here. So, so let's start with that. I, I agree completely. This is something where you want to work with your tax accountant. There is no clear guidance yet from the Accounting Standards Board on what the proper way to record this is. The thing I'd like to really emphasize is do not record it as income because you don't want it to show up as taxable income and you don't want to confuse your tax accountant. So um, coordinating with your tax accountant uh, before you record it, making sure you don't record it as taxable income is um, probably the most critical piece of advice that I can give here. As far as the various options, um, as you said, Greg, if uh, you were going to achieve 100% forgiveness, then treating it as a conditional contribution uh, would be the easiest uh, way to go because it involves much less uh, subsequent entries on your financial statements um, to get everything to the point where the loan is forgiven. But if not, um, you may find in working with your accountants that option one um, is better because then you would be left with an item on your balance sheet for the remaining balance on the loan and any accrued interest with that. So this is situational. It depends on your company. It depends on how your accountant prefers to do it. So certainly work with them. Okay. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay. Our final polling question. So there is some talk right now, and I think it's even past the house about some revisions in the, uh, in, in the package here about extending the weeks and about reducing the 75% number down. Uh, but do you expect Congress to pass this and what that means, both Congress, both the House and Senate to pass it? Um, yes or no on this? And I want to just say, what the heck are they doing again? More confusion. As you, as you fill out that, let's go to the next slide, please. So, I think it's really important to track the not only all the document, all the usage of what you, what you use the triple P loan proceeds for. You really need to be able to document that and, and maintain appropriate documentation, especially if you had an e, EIDL loan. So, you know, you can't double dip and use them for both the same thing. So you really have to track what you're using it for. A key thing to uh, do. Eric and I will try to keep you well informed of what forgiveness, additional forgiveness guidance is out there, but yet keep your eyes alert. It is changing constantly. And the pending legislation could be significant changes. You know, we're still uh, waiting for the Senate to pick it up. Um, there's some talks the Senate might not even pick it up. We don't know. We can't, uh, you know, certainly predict 
the politics of, of, uh, of the, uh, Washington, D.C. Let's go to the next slide, please. But based on that, even though we can't predict it, we want to tell you a little about what the House passed. But before we do that, Elisa, can you tell us what the, okay, here's what it is. Oh, 52% think there's going to be some change. That there's going to be, that they're going to extend the week period. Okay, so it's almost, uh, in, 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 and then about a quarter say no, and about a quarter says, uh, who cares? But Eric, you've done some work on this. Why don't you talk about at least what the House has passed and what might happen or not? The House passed uh, a very broad set of rules to make it much, much easier to meet the forgiveness criteria. And I think it would take it to the point where most companies will uh, be able to achieve full forgiveness. Um, and this passed the House, by the way, 417 to one. So there was overwhelming bipartisan support for it. Um, when, and they've sent it to the Senate. Uh, as Greg said, we don't know exactly what the Senate will do. They've had some competing bills uh, that make a little bit less generous changes. So we have to stay tuned. But basically the highlights here, um, are they've extended the use of funds period from eight weeks to 24 weeks, which is huge. It's three times as long to use the funds for payroll um, and other expenses. They moved the deadline to rehire from the end of June out to the end of the year. Um, and then they lowered to 60% uh, from 75, the portion of the funds that could be used on the non-payroll costs. And this is particularly important for restaurants and other businesses that have very high overhead relative to salary. So lots of rent um, and expensive costs for utilities and the like. Um, and the combination of these three things, uh, as I said, will make it much, much easier to meet the forgiveness period. Then if you still don't meet all the forgiveness period, they've extended the term of the loan from two years out to five years. And, and this is huge because if you think about it, you won't know uh, at least until uh, six months into the program whether you've met the forgiveness criteria. So that would have left you 18 months to pay back a loan um, as opposed to five years. Um, and or if you take those six months out, four and a half years, and that will make a huge difference um, in your monthly payment or reduce your monthly payment uh, by uh, well over uh, half uh, of what it was. So that's a very big uh, improvement there. And the other change is they're allowing for the continued deferral of payroll uh, taxes even after you have gotten forgiveness on the PPP loan. Um, and that lets you defer those payroll taxes out to the end, 50% uh, out to the end of 2021 and 50% out to the end of 2022 for all of your calendar year 2000 payroll taxes. And that's a big help for cash flow. But again, we do not know if any of this will become law. I do want to say one thing, especially for those few of you that got this huge triple P um, uh, 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 contributions. You only have 18 months to pay back a loan. So if you have a loan, if you got that loan and you weren't able to get it forgiven or a large part not forgiven, um, uh, 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 you're going to have 18 months to pay back five or six or $700,000. Those, those are going to be significant monthly payments. So just be aware of that as you go through this forgiveness and thinking about how you're going to pay back uh, a, a loan of that size in 18 months. And that's all you will have because you won't know, as, as Eric said, for six months, even though it's a two-year loan, you're not going to know to month you know, for the first six months, whether it's going to be, because it, it's deferred, whether you have to pay it back or not. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, we're ready for questions. Elisa, can you help us here, please? Absolutely. All right, so um, I'm just going to scan through the list here. Um, there was quite a bit of confusion as you were talking. I just want to raise this, this item first. Um, people seem to be confused why 100% of the loan can't be forgiven if they use the entirety of the loan for payroll. Um, that came in a couple times. So I thought maybe you could address that first. Uh, so let's, let, let me clarify and make sure I understand the question. But if 
they have enough payroll to get to 100% uh, of the loan amount. There's no requirement that you use 25% for other purposes. You can use 100% for payroll and, and achieve forgiveness. The 25% was let, meant to give you room to use some of the funds for non-payroll costs if you couldn't get there with payroll. So uh, that's not a problem. Perfect. That's, that's really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, all right. There were a few questions. Um, I know there was a poll question about people still applying for PPP. Um, can you just clarify that those funds are still available and it's still possible to apply? It is certainly possible to apply and there's over $100 billion still available. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, one thing that we also heard was um, wondering during that sort of payback period, what, what is the interest that would be accrued on the particular? It, yeah. It's 1%. Okay. Thank you so much. A um, couple of questions about um, being able to deduct or to count payments towards independent contractors and if that's allowed with the forgiveness application. No. Thank you. It's employees only. Okay. Um, so this is sort of a more specific question that someone's asking if they bring back all their employees and the money runs out before they can reopen, what would you suggest in that case? Would they have to go back on unemployment at that point? So there is nothing in the rule that prevents you from laying people off subsequent to the payroll period if you can't con afford to continue to employ them. And yes, they would be eligible to reapply for unemployment coverage um, if they're laid off again. Thank you. Um, and then there's some people asking about repayment and how soon they can begin to start the repayment process. Um, well, you know, that's an interesting question because uh, I, I've, uh, Eric and I have clients that, um, if you recall, if you have an EIDL advance and a triple P, the portion uh, that re the amount that the EIDL advances will not be forgiven. So if you had an EIDL advance for 10,000 and a triple P for 100,000, you're for sure gonna have 10,000 of that triple P that will turn into a loan. So I had suggested to some of my clients that if they had the cash available, there's no reason to pay interest on that if they don't need it to pay back that 10,000 already. Um, the, the, you know, there's still a lot of confusion and they, uh, the banks were at this point not willing to take that money back. So I don't know when you can actually start paying but I know that, uh, that we're probably not set up for payment as of yet. Do you think so, Eric? I think that the, right now it's a mechanical issue and not knowing how to take that payment and being set up for it. But once they figure that out, there are no prepayment penalties on the, these loans. So you can pay them back whenever you'd like. Thank you so much. Um, question about whether the state of California will consider the PPP loan forgiveness in the same way that the IRS will? I, have I don't nothing. think we... Yeah, I haven't Go seen ahead, anything Eric. on Pardon that. Me. That's fine. I, I, I haven't seen anything on that uh, and uh, have no way to answer that at this point. Okay, thank you. Um, bear with me just another moment here. A um, couple questions about um, employees and their employment status. Um, if someone, they, they have pay, pay, um, paperwork and green cards from their employees, but they suspect some of them may not be in the United States legally. Um, will there be a problem getting their wage payments forgiven? Well, I think there's a bigger um, problem if they have reason to believe that they are hiring someone on falsified documents, uh, and I would suggest they get advice on how to deal with that more broadly. Yeah, I think this is one of these, you, you need to seek out a, a labor attorney, maybe an immigration attorney. And so you have questions about the documentation, the validity of the documents that were provided to you for employment. Um, if, you, if, you have, if you believe the documents are falsified, and that is your belief, um, it's unlikely that you can, uh, uh, you know, submit with the reps 
and, and certifications that uh, those individuals are, uh, you know, eligible for the payroll protection plan. But you, you should really seek a, a labor attorney on this. And, and if you, anyone has questions about the documents that employees are, are providing to you, you know, you should uh, do your research on that to make sure you believe they're, they're valid documents. Thank you so much. Um, just a few more questions, if that's all right with the two of you. Sure. Okay. Um, great. So there was a, um, as you were talking about EIDL and the $10,000 um, advance, that someone was quite passionately asking that their understanding was that the EIDL advance is supposed to be a grant and does not have to be paid back. Can you clarify what, what that means in the context of PPP, please? Certainly, the EIDL is a grant and it does not have to be paid back. That's absolutely correct. However, the amount of the grant, of the EID, ED, EIDL grant, has to be deducted from the triple P amount, and that that amount will not be forgiven under the triple P loan, and that amount will become a a loan to the company. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you so much. Um, there were a couple questions about um, sort of health insurance and the deductions or health insurance as well as deductions for things like payroll tax. Um, can you maybe go over that just a, a short, briefly again? Greg, you want to do it? You want me to do it? Oh, go ahead. Do you want to, do, you want to, do we, should we bring back that slide or not? Can you do it without the slide? Yeah. I'll start health insurance uh, for employees, not owners. There, um, one more. Nice one. Okay, got it. No, no, is, one more. One more. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, one is more. included Sorry. in the calculation for forgiveness. So if you have, um, if you're pl paying benefits, health insurance uh, for your employees, there's a, then that would be included in the calculation. Um, and that's not a problem at all for owners. Uh, you cannot include that. Um, and then what was the other, I'm sorry, the other part uh, um, that was- There was a general question about sort of payroll tax and whether that can be counted right. for forgiveness. Okay. So payroll tax, we broke that out. And the distinction there is that state employer portions of the state taxes are deductible the employer portion of the federal tax. So that state is state disability insurance and unemployment insurance. Um, federal employer contributions for FICA and Medicare are not included in the calculation. Um, and so those need to be excluded, but the employee portions would be included because you use the gross wages number. So if you pay someone $100,000 a year and then deduct out withholding and FICA and Medicare and the like, um, you get to work off of the gross number for the employee portion. And, and the good news is that many of the payroll processors uh, are well aware of these rules and they really have figured it out and, and provide you with the right numbers. Thank you. Um, the, the gentleman who asked the question did just say that the question was specific to owner employees. Um, I believe okay, so for correct. owners, you cannot deduct or include um, the owner um, employee uh, be and benefits or health insurance and retirement uh, contributions. Those are excluded from the forgiveness calculation for, for owners. Um, if you are an owner and you're taking a salary and uh, are doing withholding um, based on that salary, the same rules would apply to the state and federal insurance as to any other employee all subject to the caps that we've talked about. Thank you so much. Just reading through my list here really quickly, please bear with me just a moment. Um, oh, there was one question in regard to if someone is, um, someone's loan application is not accepted and the loan is not forgiven, are, do you, are you aware at this point, is it possible to resubmit the 3508 form? Eric, do you know what the, um, I, I don't know, and I can't, I think I read something on it, but I cannot remember what the appeal process is 
Do you remember Eric or not? No, I don't. I apologize. I, so we, we, if if that person could uh, email uh, 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 score, and we'll get that, we're going to answer back to them about okay. the appeal process. Great. Um, the remaining questions are sort of more general, and I'm just going to take a moment and um, show the score website. So there were some questions about if someone wanted to have some assistance with the, the application or talk to a mentor. Right on our homepage at santabarber.score.org, there was a find your mentor button. Um, if you click that button, that you'll be brought through a process where you can submit a form and request a mentor. And we highly recommend that you do do that. Um, so just to make sure you're aware of where that, that is. Um, and then the other question we got was in regard to um, uh, webinars about use of QuickBooks. Um, and I'll just show this slide um, that we do have a session coming up on Wednesday about managing your PPP and EIDL funding through QuickBooks. Um, so please just uh, do, do keep, check out our website for that information as well. And lastly, I'm sorry, um, just want to confirm as well that we will be sending the PowerPoint for this presentation as well as the recording um, when we send the, the information out tomorrow. Greg, I'm sorry, I'll turn it back to you. That was those really covers all the questions. So um, I'll turn it back over. No, I think that's great. And we're, um, uh, Eric and I, thank you for attending. And as Elise said, if you have questions or concerns, please uh, look for a SCORE mentor. And thank you very much.